Hey, good morning, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's what they call Sunday. We already know that God hates Sunday, where they worship the sun. And we're going to get that calendar right. Sean's working on that. I'm going to give us some codes that clarify. Amen. What day's what? Amen. I like that. I like that. I love that. Love God's heart. I want to know what he knows, man. And I want to be walking in his will. And what he wills us to know, man. I want to know it and do it. Let's do that thing. Right on? Hallelujah. I'm so glad to be here this morning with you. I praise God for this opportunity. Oh, Heather's here. Good morning, Heather. She says, read that Bible, man. Get saved, man. And that's what her note is here is get saved before the rapture. That's right now as I'm speaking. But very soon... It'll be after the rapture. Before the rapture, you just believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection. After the rapture, to be saved, to be in right standing with the Lord, you're going to have to believe in His death, burial, and resurrection. That, that is what paid the price for your exit from hell, your exit from earth, and your entrance into heaven. And you're going to confess it. You're going to call out to the Lord, Lord God, save me. I've been a fool here. Save me, save me, Lord Jesus. And whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved in the tribulation. And you'll keep on walking with him. You'll, you'll have, your, your works will follow you in the tribulation, all the way to getting your head cut off. Because you will not deny the Lord in the tribulation. Uh, all those going to heaven. There's going to be a lot of folks who, who said that, Oh, Jesus, I need you. But then they're going to get real hungry. And their bellies will be growling. And they'll be like, okay, yeah, whatever. Give me that mark so I can get me some a peanut butter sandwich and some milk. GMO, right? Made straight by the devil. Don't sell your souls, folks. Don't sell your heart right now. Savio, Kush, Kim, good morning. Bless the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. He's our bride. He's the Jews' Messiah, and he's our bride. Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, we are a super blessed folks, man. We are a super blessed folks. I praise God for your being here. We're going through the book of Ruth, man. And just as a reminder, uh, going back over to an overview, there was a family who left Bethlehem, the house of bread, and they went on down to Moab to sojourn during the time of a famine. Now, looking back 10 years uh, later, uh, they should have never left. But they went with what they thought. And Elimelech, the husband, he hawked the farm, he hawked their land, took the money, and ran on down to Moab. Now, thank God, God made provisions for when you hawk your land. It can't remain forever hawked. It has to go back to the family every 50th year, or it can be purchased back at any time. Okay? So he hawks his land, takes his wife, his two sons, and heads on down to... Moab, Erwin, good morning, brother. God bless you, man. We're praying for you guys, praying for you all the way from South Africa. Glad to have you with us, man. And so he, he hawks his land, takes his family on down to Moab. And they meant to sojourn there, but they ended up staying for 10 years. And in that 10 years, Elimelech died, Malan and Kilian died, the two sons. So what was left was the, the wife, her name's Naomi, which meant blessed and pleasant, and the two daughter-in-laws who were Moabitess. Now, guys, in the eyes of an Israelite, Moab was just a filthy, filthy, filthy place. And on the surface, it really is. I mean, their whole nation was started through incest. A dad having sex with his daughter, and that offspring was the head of Moab. Okay, Moab and Ammon. Bad, bad deal, bad choices, terrible. Woo! And so from the start, Ruth didn't have a good past. She didn't have a, a good history coming back to Israel. Now, we know the story. We went over it a couple weeks ago, covered it last week, that it was time. Naomi said, I've had enough of this place. I've gone from being pleasant to being so bitter. My life has been a mess. It's been a ruination. I am out of here. Girls, I'm splitting. Y'all get back with your families. Go worship your gods. And Orpus said, okay, sure, I'm out of here. And Ruth said, no, 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 
Something, something in Ruth. Something in Ruth saw something in Naomi and the stories concerning their God really, really drew her in favor toward this God, toward the land of Israel, toward Naomi. She'd rather be with her than her own kinfolks. And when Naomi begged her, get on, get get home. I got nothing for you. I got no more kids. You can't have any children by me. Your life will only be ruined if you come home with me. And Ruth said, oh, I beg you. Entreat me not to leave you or to return from following after you. Wherever you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. And where you're buried, that's where I want to be buried. But your husband's buried here in Moab. Your brother-in-law, your father-in-law, they're all buried here in Moab. Your mom and dad, your great-grandparents, they'll be buried here in Moab. She goes, I, I, no, I want to be buried with you, Naomi. Wherever you go and lodge, your people, that's where I want to be. And when she saw that she was not going to change her mind. She said, okay, come on, let's go. And they headed back on that 50-mile journey back to Bethlehem. And then last week we saw chapter 2, verse 1, Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. Naomi had a kinsman and her, of her husband's uh, family, a mighty man of wealth, and that's what his name meant, a mighty man, a man of might, a man of success, a man of power. Unlike Donald Trump, guys, I, I cannot understand how Godly people follow this guy. He built Atlantic City with the mafiosos. And he's never repented of it. He doesn't think he's ever sinned. Use their money, their rebar, their concrete. And there's a whole, whole lot of evil up in that. That's just a start. And then all the whores and all the gangsters that would come to the Taj Mahal and the other places there at Atlantic City. Evil, wickedness, man. And people embracing this guy as he's a good guy. It's time to learn what a good guy is in the eyes of God. And Boaz was a good guy. He was a man of might. Uh, but Trump is a man of might. He's a man of wealth. He's got a name going ahead. He puts his name on everything. Trump this, Trump that, Trump. You better go with Boaz on this one. Okay, and then Satan took his wonderful, awesome name and has made it one of the two major pillars of the Freemasons. Every Freemason lodge has a pillar and a pillar. One is named Boaz and the other Jockton. And God, it was, this was Solomon that did that. When Solomon built the temple, that's what he did in the temple. And then all the Freemason lodges patterned themselves after Solomon's temple. You know, with Solomon's seal, the star of rim fan. I was watching a preacher in Oklahoma today, prophecy watchers preacher. They had him on there. And he said, he goes through the etymology of how the star of David came about. And it didn't come about till the 14th century. And what they did was took the seal of Solomon and dude, you should have gone back farther in your research. You should have gone farther back in your Bible in the research. You see, God has letting nobody off on this because the Old Testament folks, the Jews, who will only stick with the Old Testament, they've got Amos telling them that that star is the star of Rimphan and the devil. And then we, the Christian who love the Old Testament and the New, we have it both in Amos and Acts telling us, and we got a guy getting killed over it. Stephen, as he told that story, he got smoked, man. Amen. And so here we have Ruth coming back with Naomi. They come there and they got a mighty man in front of them and he's a mighty man of God. God considers him a mighty man, a man of strength, okay? And so we continue there in chapter two, verse two. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, okay, let me know, now go and get us some food. We're a pair of starving widows. We have nothing. We have no husbands. We have no land. We have nothing. And let me go and uh, try to find us some food. And God made a way for the poor people to be able to glean behind the reapers in a field. It was a command in the law. God takes care of the poor. He loves the poor and needy. He loves widows. He loves the children who are helpless. He loves them, and he wants us to take care of them and treat them well as well. It's a test. It's a test for the truth, for the real. And pass your test, guys. Love folks. Love folks that are unlovable by others. Love the outcast. Love the degenerate who can't help themselves. The people who are just downtrodden. 
help them, love them, especially pray for them. Uh, many of us in this world, we're getting downtrodden ourselves. We're, we're becoming part of their caste system and in their class. And we just ain't got a ton of money. We're like the disciples who didn't have money to help. Lord, Guys, give me some money. Say, give me some money. Oh, alms for the poor. Alms for the poor. And they're like, yeah, we're part of that group too. Um, we have the name of Jesus. Would you like to walk? Yeah, sure. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And that's what we have. We take the name of Jesus with us and the spirit of Jesus, the fruit of the spirit of Jesus in us. And we have what nobody else has in the world outside of Jesus. And we have an awful lot to give. And it doesn't always mean mammon and in the monetary sense. And people are looking for somebody to love them. People are looking for someone to accept them and bless them into the beloved. And that's what James faced. The brother of Jesus, half-brother of Jesus, faced two groups of people in the church, the rich and the poor. And the rich would say, you sit down there over there. You don't belong over here in our section. Oh, God hates that with a passion, man. Because at the Calvary, at Calvary's cross, we all have the same level. We all have the same location. And God sees us all right there at the level, level spot of Calvary's cross. And we ought to see each other like that as well. And so here's these two poor little uh, widows, man. You got no help, no, no, nothing. And Ruth, we see her attitude. We see her character in all this. I'm going to go take care of us. I've got the strength. We don't know how old Naomi was. We know that she nursed the baby that comes later. Okay? And I don't know what all that involves. But we know that she nursed the baby, her own baby. You see, all of this, Ruth, we, we see her love, her love, her love, her love, her love through this whole thing. And by the time we, those of us that know the story, we know that she and Boaz finally end up marrying and having a baby called Obed. Do you know that that baby didn't belong to either Boaz or Ruth? That was Naomi's baby. She did all this for love for Naomi so she could have a name after her for the deceased. And so did Boaz. Love, love, love. This was in her heart. And what we see her right at the beginning, after she had shown her love and said, I'm leaving my family and I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go with your God. I'm going to be buried where you're buried. I'm going to lodge where you're lodging. We see her there where she's lodging. And I don't know where that is. In a tent? Do, do they have a, a homeless section there? I, I don't know where they are. But she says, I'm going to go get us some food. And she gets up, Ruth Ruth gets up, and she asks Naomi, is it okay if I go do this? And Naomi said, go. She didn't even send her with the blessing of the Lord. She didn't say, God bless you. Let's pray about this. None of, none of that. She said, go ahead, man. I'm starving. Go get. And what do we see here? Verse 2. We're in Ruth 2, 2. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Oh, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn, barley. We know that's to be barley. After him whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Okay, go. Sounds great. Uh, hey, Brother JB and fam. Hey, Tyvon. Heather says, Tomorrow morning I'm taking a new outreach worker out for the first time. Please pray that people we come across will see Jesus, not us that they have a hunger for the bread of life. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. God will bring those along. And that's part of today's sermon. God will bring those along and have you go to the right field. You'll be in the right field. Praise God. Be, remember to be praying for Heather, guys. And she said, I'm going to go find somebody that, that'll let me glean behind the gleaners. And that's what Jesus had in the law. God wrote in the law, that the poor were to be taken care of and they were going to be allowed to go into the fields and follow the gleaners, the workers, the hired hands, the hired guns or the slaves, you know, the servants of the people. And what was going to be for the poor people is whatever was dropped. Whatever. And the rule was, if you drop something on the ground, don't you dare pick it up, reapers. You leave that for the gleaners, the, the poor people behind you. That's all the food they get. So they're waiting for you to drop something. And it would be a little stalk here, a little stalk of barley there, here and there. And as soon as the poor saw it, man, they'd grab, grab a hold of it, and it was theirs. It was a gift from God. Okay? And so that's what she was doing. She was going out there in the faith of Naomi's God, which is now her God, saying, and my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I'm just looking for a man in whose eyes I'll find grace and he'll let me glean behind his gleaners. 
he'll let me as a poor woman, a widow, walk and work behind his hired guns. And so that's what she's doing. Verse 3, and she went and came and gleaned in a field after the reapers and her happenstance. Now, guys, you and I both know there ain't no happenstance with the Lord. You don't just happen to do things and God's like, oh, my, who's this in my field over here? Okay, so, so she just happened this way. And so now how are we going to deal with her? God was guiding her all the way from Moab. God put it in her heart. He knew what was in her heart. He knows what's in your heart. And she saw something, she knew something about him in Naomi and the stories they told, knowing that her whole being had been from a mess, an incestuous mess, and her whole background is just filled with demons and demon worship and child sacrifice, just a mess. And she didn't hear any of that concerning Israel. She heard about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their Gentile wives. They were Gentile wives too. Praise God, man. And then all the 12 sons they had, their wives were Gentiles. Wow, I can be part of that. God loves the Gentiles, folks. Jews, you need to know that we're not goyim. We're not just pigs and cattle. Jesus loves us too. And Jesus loved you, and you guys as a nation refused him. You were the first, but you refused him, and you became the last. So now the Gentiles are all accepted into the Beloved just like this blessed Ruth. Praise God. Aren't you thankful that he reached out to all of us? He allowed us all in. He didn't look at our background. He didn't look at our pedigree. Aren't you thankful for that? He doesn't look at your paperwork on the wall behind you. Look at me. Look what I went through. L look what I experienced. Look at me. Look at here. This was my bachelor's. This was my master's. And this over here is my doctorate. And I got a second doctorate. I don't care nothing about that, man. He's looking at your heart concerning himself, concerning your faith in what he has said in his word. Know his word, hide his word, share his word. That's why we encourage you to read 10 to 20 chapters every day. 10 to 20 chapters every day. Come to know the heart and mind of the Lord Jesus Christ and live it out. Walk it out by faith, man. And she happened to land in this guy's field. She didn't happen to do anything. God directed her there. God put it in her heart. Get up and go. God puts things in your heart daily, even as a believer. Now, you have the option to whether you're going to get up and go or just sit there at the house. Don't sit there at the house. When it's time for the kings to go to war, you go to war, buddy. Don't you stay at the house and find you a Bathsheba. That sin lieth at the door when we're unwilling to walk with the Lord. There's no happenstance. There's no happenstance. It, it just happened to be. Mm -mm. It's leadership of the Lord. Follow his leadership. If he's, if he's encouraging you to go out the door and go do something, go do it. There's a plan. There's a will. God has a way, man. And where his will is, there is a way. He always makes a way where his desire is for you. There's no happenstance in your life. Now, here's what we find out through this whole process, okay? We got Ruth, and she's had some bad, bad situations. We got Naomi. She's had some bad, bad, rough times, man, okay? So Naomi went from being pleasant to being bitter through her bad times. Naomi, she saw the power of the Lord. She saw God's goodness. She saw his grace. She said, I'm going to go find other people in whose eyes I can find grace. I'm gonna, and she looked at the God side of things. I want to encourage you to look at the God side of things. Know his Bible, believe every word of it. You to have him be your blessed hope. You walk in faith concerning him. Uh, these three, faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these is charity. But you got to have some faith, hope there too, man. Have faith in the Lord. Have hope in his, his truth, guys. We have a blessed hope in the rapture, okay? You guys know that on Resurrection Sunday, June 8th, is exactly two months from the eclipse. God's marking this thing out. He's walking us along. Pay attention to him. Don't just happen to, you know, exist, coexist, all that jazz. You walk with the Lord and know there's a purpose, a will, and a way. You walk alongside him in the word. And you listen to his voice. You listen to his G. You listen to his ha. And if we're, we're going to turn right, turn right. If we're going to turn left, you turn left. You just stay there in the yoke with the Lord Jesus Christ and let him lead. Lead on, O King Eternal. Lead on, lead on. And God wants us to follow his leadership. And so she happens to land in the field of this guy. Verse three, we're in Ruth two, three. 
And her hap was to land in the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Now, they had huge fields and they had landlines. This portion belongs to Cousin Vinny. This portion over here belongs to Cousin, you know, Ralphie. And this portion, whatever. It, in the family, it was inherited all the way down. And so they had one field with landlines. And the landline she happened to get into was Boaz. Boaz was the, uh, we don't know how he was related, but he was the family member closest to Elimelech, save one. There was one guy who was a closer relative. You know how you got your cousin and your cousin twice removed and, you know, my cousin or my mother. Boaz was number two in relationship to Elimelech, Naomi's husband. There was one guy closer, and we're going to see him here in the future. And she happened to be in the field that belonged to Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Verse 4, Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. Now he came from the city of Bethlehem out to the country out in the fields that he owned. He was going to check in on his workers. I want you to understand what kind of a guy this guy was. Okay? So he comes in from Bethlehem, verse 4, and he said unto his reapers, Man, the Lord be with you guys. And his reapers looked him in the eyeballs and they said, Well, the Lord bless you too, brother. He brought God to work with him. I worked with many a Christian who you had no clue they were Christian while you were working with them. They wouldn't bless you. They wouldn't encourage you. They wouldn't bring the Lord Jesus Christ into any conversation. And here's Boaz, the richest guy in town, who's got his hired guns. And when he walks on him, he says, man, more than anything, I want the Lord Jesus Christ to bless you and his favor to shine on you. And they looked at him with genuine smiles because they knew his heart. They knew how he had treated them last year and the year before. These were probably of the people who, when they hawked themselves as bond slaves to be his workers, uh, Boaz, uh, my my family, we're, we're in dire straits. We're about to lose our house. I'd like to be your servant for the next seven years, okay? And I'd like you to purchase my land so we don't lose it. And they would hawk themselves as servants into the family. I could see these guys being the ones who said, you know what? I don't want to leave. After seven years, they, they were allowed to leave and be set free from that. And there's a lot of people called bond slaves. And they would love their owner. They would love their master. They would love their boss. And they're like, I ain't going nowhere. I want to stay right here. And I believe these people were of that ilk because Boaz was of that ilk. Boaz showed up from his hometown there in Bethlehem and he went out to the fields to meet with the reapers. And he said, guys, God bless you, man. Praise the Lord. Probably gave him a big old hug. Probably loved on him. These are my workers, man. I want to take care of my workers. And we know that he did. And he took care of them and he blessed him in the Lord and they blessed him right back. He wasn't a taskmaster. He, he didn't have the whip out like Pharaoh's bunch. Just before all of this was, we had the book of Exodus. And these people are the remnant who had come out of Egypt through that Exodus. And now we're in the time of the judges when they had no king. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And this guy being rich and having money, he could have chosen to be a bad guy and a ruler and a mafioso and to control the whole town of Bethlehem and the fields outside but instead, he took his free will, and he chose to bless the Lord and bless the people in his life. And guys, you're really blessing the Lord when you bless those who can't bless you back. When those who can't help you, when they're helpless, and you bless them anyway, and you make them feel loved, valued, appreciated, accepted with a sense of belonging, that's called blessing. And when somebody in your life doesn't feel loved, valued, accepted with a sense of belonging, that's a curse. And many people have placed themselves there in that curse through their rejection of you. Guys, there's people I know that would be so blessed if they would allow me into their life because God's put it in my heart to be a blesser. I want to bless you. I want to bring you Jesus, man. And they hate me. They despise me. They will not let me into their lives. And their lives are out there outside the blessing. And so they have shut me off, just like you. You guys know what I'm talking about. 
Those of you who walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, who are close to him, who only want to bring the blessings of God to them, and they have cut you off. They have cursed you, and in doing so, they've cursed themselves. You guys, I'm going to encourage you to be a people. If you know people who are blessed, who are godly in your world, don't shut them off. Don't shut them off. The devil wants to come to you and bring people who love the Lord, the God, with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They love their neighbor as themselves, and they're going to have you become jealous of them, jealous of their post, jealous of how many likes they get, jealous of, you know, the list goes on. When you understand and you get past the devil and his influence and his trying to drag you away from the blessing, and you say, no, you know what? This girl, she loves the Lord Jesus Christ with all her heart. All she seeks to do is please him. All she wants to do is edify the believers. I am not going to follow you, Satan, in being jealous of her and hating her. I'm going to love her with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm going to love her. I'm going to support her. I'm going to take care of her. I'm going to make her feel loved, valued, appreciated with a sense of belonging, and I'm going to make an effort to do that. We're not just going to drag this thing around like a dead corpse attached to my leg. Let me drag this. Stop dragging my corpse around. We're not going to do that. We're going to bring life. We're going to bring the Lord Jesus Christ there. We're going to say, Lord, breathe into this nostrils the breath of life. Me, starting with me. I want to be a living soul, a living sacrifice, one who's living for you, doing your thing, and not living a life of hell, not living a life of jealousy, not living a life of hatred, not living a life of disdain in my heart with envy and strife and backbiting. I don't want any of that. I want to love those for whom you have died, Lord, whether they're rich or poor. It doesn't matter to me. If you died for them, I want to be part of the life-giving uh, element in, in their existence. I, I want to bring them life and not death. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Amen? Bring life. Bring life. God says, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Choose blessing. I set before you today death and life. Choose life. Praise God. Uh, even if they have a false gospel, we still love them, right? Yeah, you love them, but you rebuke them. Tell them, you're going to hell, dude. Your gospel sending you straight to hell. Boom. And we don't have to be best buddies with them, but you don't hate them. In your heart. God is looking at your heart, how you treat folk. Love everybody, guys. I don't have to hang with you. There's, there's a lot of Christians who are walking in the flesh, and they're just jerks, man. I don't have to hang with you. But I need to love you. I need to pray for you when you ain't around. I need to let the Lord know, Lord, I love this person. I want you to bless them. You died for them. You did everything you could for them. And I want to do everything I can for them. And right now I know that means prayer. And I want to pray for them. Amen. And this is the type of guy Boaz was. He could have chosen to go mafioso, headstrong. I'm going to control you. Be a control freak, man. All my... Uh, people are going to work for me and they're going to know that I'm the man and they're going to do what I say. But he wasn't like that. He came in the field and said, praise God, guys. God bless you. And they look back at him and say, well, God bless you. What a gig. I've worked with so many Christian folks who wouldn't bless the Lord in your presence, who were jealous of you, who hated you, who didn't want you to succeed, didn't want you to excel, didn't read their Bibles, Get away from church, and at church they is a deacon and acting all good and lackey, and boy, preacher, <laughs> laughing at the preacher's jokes, and oh, preacher, you're so awesome, oh, and then leave them and hate me and the other Christians on the job. Not Boaz. Boaz was the same, just like his Lord yesterday, today, and forever. He left that field yesterday, and they expected him to arrive the same way he left yesterday, blessing them, blessing the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, come praise the Lord with me, man. God bless you guys. God bless you, boss. Praise the Lord. And these were the kind of people, because he was the kind of boss, who probably didn't want to leave after their seven years was up. Can I keep working for you? I, I love working in the field for you. I'd rather have you as my boss than some other dum-dum. They had that choice. Boaz had that choice. What kind of a believer am I going to be today? How am I going to represent heaven today? How am I going to represent the Lamb of Bethlehem today? You got that choice, folks. When you go out in your field, when you go to work on Tuesday here in the USA, we, we have Memorial Weekend, and so most places are closed on Monday. 
when you go back to work and you meet your people, what are they going to find? Why don't they find a Boaz? Why don't they find somebody who loves the Lord with all their heart, who treats people well, who is going to, we see here in a second, treat the widows well. Okay? He happens there, he sees his people, and then he goes, who's that young lady? What's going on there? Let's follow along in the scriptures. Ruth 2, verse 4. And behold, Boaz, he came in from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, Oh, man, the Lord be with you guys. And they answered him, Well, the Lord bless you. Verse 5. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over his foreman. He had a servant who was the lead man. And so he's talking to him about the day's accomplishments and everything what's going on. And verse 5, Boaz said unto that servant, the, the foreman, the head dude that was set over the reapers, uh, who does this damsel belong to? Who, who is this young lady? Who's, who's her parents? What, what's her story? Verse 6. And the servant that was set over the reapers, the foreman, answered and said, Well, this is the, the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Everybody knew the story. I mean, Bethlehem, it's a small town, it's a small area. Everybody knew everybody. She, Naomi, had been in Bethlehem. That was her life, her whole life, except for the last 10 years. And so they all knew her. She got cousins and aunts and family. Remember Jesus when he was inside Mary's belly? They had to leave all the way from Nazareth and come down to Bethlehem because they were of the house and lineage of David. All the family got together during that census. Remember when the king made the census and all the, when all Caesar made the census and all the world went to be taxed and Joseph and Mary went to their own town? because they were the house and lineage of David. They had to all go back to Bethlehem and they would meet up with their families. I mean, every year, three times a year, they would go down and celebrate these three feasts and they would join family from down that way. And they were of that house. Everybody knew everybody's business. Everybody knew the story. Hey, how you doing? They would catch up. And so the story flamed across the whole little area here, Bethlehem and the outer skirts of Bethlehem, that Naomi came back empty except for this young Moabitish woman. And she wasn't, guys, and you can't consider her a regular Moabite, they would say. She, she's chosen Jesus. She's chosen Jehovah. She she wants God's ways. She don't want any ways of the Moabites. She left her family. She left her dead husband laying in a grave back there. And she said, I'm going to the land of the living. And she's chosen Jesus. So everybody knew the story, though not everybody had met her face to face yet. And this is Boaz. He knows the story, but he hadn't met her face to face just yet. And he happens uh, uh, to land in his field here and he talks to his foreman. Hey, praise the Lord. God bless you. And the foreman says, God bless you. And all the reapers look up and they go, God bless you, sir. And then he says, hey, hey foreman, who's this young gal over here? And the foreman says, oh, that's the, the story. You know, she's the young lady that everybody's been talking about that came back with Naomi. That's her. And Boaz said, that's her. Wow. Continue the story. Chapter 2, verse 6. And the servant that was set over the reapers, the foreman, he answered and said, it's the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I beg you, uh, may I please glean here and gather among your reapers, um, among the sheaves? So she came and she's continued even from this morning till right now. And she has stayed a, a little in the house. And she tarried a little in the house. Verse 8, that means at break time, she came on in to the cool, to the out of the sun and stuff. She, she's been with us. She's, she took break with us. She's remained with us. She didn't split after break. She's still here working. Verse 8, then said Boaz to Ruth, uh, hearest thou not my daughter? Go, I don't want you to go to anybody else's field. You're welcome right here. You can come here as often as you need to come. We have plenty and uh, I just want to say, the Lord bless you too. Not just the locals, not just the people that he knew. I bless you. Have you ever been in a church like that? The cliques, where they all like each other and kind of you're left out somehow and you don't feel loved and valued, appreciated with a sense of belonging? Not Boaz. He included everybody. And he said, oh, you're little Ruth. You're the one that has chosen Jesus Christ, a new convert. Well, let me take you under my wing and let you know how we do things here in Jesusville. We look after each other. And just as you've seen my foreman over here, me blessing him, I want to bless you. 
And I want you to know that you're welcome here in this field anytime you want to come and take care of you and Naomi. Everybody knew the story. This wasn't like it was a d in the dark. Oh my, tell me more details. They already knew the details. It was family. They didn't have TV. They talked with each other. They had conversation one with another. Heather says, Boaz had integrity. Tuma, it's number 8538. He was the same in righteousness when no one was looking. Kinsman Redeemer, he's the picture of Jesus. Is that why God chose him to bring Jesus about? Cut the story short. It was because of Ruth and Boaz getting together and having this baby called Obed. And you'll never hear reference back to Obed. You always see it, the story starting with Jesse, the stem of Jesse, the root of Jesse, the rod of Jesse. Why? Because Obed belonged to Naomi. That was the baby they had for her. So she could have a son that she lost and she could have her joy back of having a baby. That was, they did all of that out of love for her. Then the grandsons and everybody came along and that was considered of Ruth, Obed beget Jesse, Jesse beget David, right? Obed, Jesse, David. Mm -hmm. Then all the other sons of David. And the one of most importance is Nathan. And nobody knows about him. Oh, we know Solomon and Absalom and, you know, the, the list goes on. But what about Nathan? We don't know one thing about him except his name shows up in a lineage of Jesus Christ, physical, through Mary. Pretty cool. And it was this couple, it was this love, it was his love for the Lord Jesus Christ, his love for the word, his love for widows, who he knew the law. He, he knew the law of Moses and the law of gleanings. And it was a command of God to do it. And Ruth could have whipped out her Old Testament and said, listen here, buddy, you're going to allow me in this field because God said you should. She, she never did that. She still walked with the Lord and following his footsteps, his lead. And she happened to follow, happened. The Bible says she happened to land in this field. God directed her steps to this field because he had the Messiah in mind. A thousand years later. God has a thousand years later in mind with you right now, dude. The millennium, you'll still have seven years left. We have at least a thousand and seven years left, including the seven-year tribulation and the 1,000-year millennium. And God has a thousand years in your future planned. You believers, you who are going to be there, you and me, the bride of Christ Jesus, bam. We may have some loved ones, guys, who are not saved, who God seeks to salvage all the way to the end. And you'll have human family members reproducing. And that thousand years might matter to you, huh? Hmm? Remember in Isaiah 66 and the last several verses? God, uh, let's read that real quick, guys. This is, a, this is a doctrine that is totally, totally missed in the church concerning... Everybody always stops at, you know, at the millennium, the great white throne judgment, and then it's over. <laughs> and they totally... Forget about eternity and what's going to happen in eternity. What, what's going to happen with all these different people groups. And God has a people group in mind. Those in the image of Adam and Eve. The same situation Adam and Eve were in, in the garden. And there was no death and there was no sin. There was just a choice. And God's going to do that, but he's going to give them a wonderful incentive of hell. Let's read... Isaiah 66 and the last, start with 21. And I will also take of them for priest and Levite, saith the Lord. For as the new heavens and new earth, which I will make, that's after the millennium. The new heavens and new earth happen after the millennium. Which I will make will remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed remain and your name remain. Because the meek shall inherit the earth. Don't ever forget that doctrine and what it's talking about. The meek shall inherit the earth. And it's going to be these meek who survived the millennium as human beings. And they kept Jesus as their king. 
They believed in him. They didn't rebel against him when Satan came and wanted the whole world to rebel. And there's going to be a batch of them who rebel against God. And they're going to be judged and thrown into the eternal lake of fire. Everybody who died in Christ during that 1,000 years are going to, uh, you know, find out their assignments and everything for eternity. But then there's a bunch of humans who just didn't die just yet. And they're still around. And what's God's promise to them? Your name will continue on. You'll have a name there. Your seed will remain and you're going to keep on having babies. You know, there ain't going to be no overpopulation problem. There's not on earth, but God's got Mars and Jupiter. What about when he makes those new heavens? Amen. The second heaven, that's going to be renewed as well. There's plenty of room. You ever seen the size of Jupiter and Neptune? Plenty of room, folks. Don't ever, don't ever shut God down and what his game plan is, but know the will of God. After there's a new heaven and a new earth, Jesus says, your name and your seed shall still remain, Israel. He's talking to Israel here. He's talking about the blessedness after they have been cursed, and Jesus the Messiah comes back and blesses them. And then after he's made the new heaven and the new earth, after the great white throne judgment, their names and their babies will still continue on. And that's important to know. So a thousand years is important to us right now. Because you just might have some family members who refuse the Lord Jesus Christ right now. They're going to be stuck in the tribulation, but God's going to allow them and their offspring to continue through the seven-year tribulation and then on through the 1,000-year millennium. And you need to look ahead. There's no happenstance. You need to walk in wisdom. Boaz did. God did. God knew that this wasn't happenstance that these two are meeting here at this time. Because God has the Messiah in mind, and he knows exactly who he wants to be the parents of this Messiah. Boaz and Ruth. But they're just now meeting for the first time. Who is that girl over there? Oh, that, that's the Moabitish woman. She's the one that came back with Naomi. That's her? Everybody in town heard who she was. And now he's meeting her for the very first time. Verse 6. And the servant that was set over all the reapers the foreman, he answered and said, it's the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Verse seven. And she said, I beg you, let me glean after your reapers among the sheaves. So she came and she's continued even from the morning until now. And she even had took break with us there at the house. Verse eight. Then said Boaz straight under Ruth, the boss man under this poor widow woman who is existing because of incest. And her gods are devilish, and her gods are murderous, and they demand blood. And he understands that she's, you know, got, gotten saved. She has chosen Jesus, Jehovah, over what she had previously. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, verse 8, Oh, hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not glean and do another field. He said, I want you to hear me clearly. Uh, you're invited here. We want you here. You are welcome here in our field. And he didn't cross the line. He respected her as a widow. We don't know if he had love in his heart right here at first sight or what. But he had put all the numbers together. He considered the family of Elimelech, his near kinsman. and But there was one kinsman closer. And so he probably didn't even expect him to be the one he probably expected the other guy to do it, and, but he's meeting her for the first time and finally find, finds out who she is, and he talks to her with great reverential, biblical respect in the eyes of God. God is watching me, and I want to do what God said to do and treat these people well. Remember, you better treat everybody well because some of us have entertained angels and didn't even know it. God's testing us. He's testing your heart. It's all about your thoughts, guys. You get your thoughts right, and your actions will be right. And your thoughts won't be made straight until you start reading your Bible. Because everything about you is drawn to the flesh, drawn to hell, drawn to Satan, drawn to sin, drawn to selfishness. That's your personal bend. And you are bent towards hell. Hell bent for leather. Okay? Jesus Christ comes along and changes things. And you read that Bible, and you start to think like Jesus Christ. When you think like Jesus Christ, you're... Persona will be at that of Jesus Christ. And that's what we see here in Boaz, the father of Jesus Christ a thousand years earlier. And there's God looking down a thousand years from now. And to you and me, it's a thousand years plus two, 
3,000 years later, and this story is still active and powerful in our lives, and we can glean, we can reap a harvest here, if we will, and learn an awful lot about God, the great harvester, and about each other, working alongside each other in the field of souls, getting along, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ, seeing you a thousand years from now, not where you are right now as a believer. I, I, we don't look at you where you are. We look what God has designed for you. And I don't know exactly what that is, but I know it's awesome in the kingdom of God and your assignment. And so I love you accordingly to that. We love each other, one another, based on that truth, those truths. Continuing on, we're in Ruth chapter 2. And he says, don't go into nobody else's field. So she came and hath continued, even from morning, verse 8. And then Boaz said to her, hey, don't go anywhere else. You don't have to go anywhere else. You're welcome here in my field. And neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. My hired girls, my, my servants, you stay right here next to them. Okay? And she had just witnessed how he takes care of his maidens. This guy loves his maidens. He, he loves his foreman. He loves the workers in his field. This guy's blessing the Lord, giving them a morning blessing, man, in the name of Jesus Christ. They didn't have to walk on eggshells around this guy because he was consistent. Don't be that eggshell idiot. Snapping, moody. How do we find you today? Good night. Get in the word of God and let us know how we're going to find you, please. Fast track this thing. You ain't got much time left. Two months and a week. That's to our first 50-day count. I surrender all, Lord. God's plan is amazing. Amen. Amen. And so she said, go, you stay close to my maidens, man, and they'll take care of you. Verse 9. Oh, let your eyes be upon the field that they do reap and go not after them. Uh, she goes, don't go after any other fields. You, you. You just stay right here with us. You stay by my maidens, man, and we'll take care of you. And he says, I've also told the young men not to lay a finger on you and not to lay any eyeballs on you. So you don't have to worry about these guys undressing you while you're working. You don't have to worry about these guys having bad thoughts about you. Christians, fellas, quit watching your porn and undressing folks, will you? Even now the ladies do it more so than others, man. All those stupid uh, commercials I get jumping on YouTube. Wicked, wicked women talking, doing the talking. And Boaz looks at this little gal and says, hey, you stay by my girls and you'll, you'll see that they're treated so well. And even my guys, they're good godly men. You just heard them blessing me and I've commanded them, don't, don't mess with you. Don't give you a hard time. Don't come on to you if you ain't looking for nobody to come on to you. And so you don't have to worry about that in my field. You may in other fields, if you leave this field and go somewhere else, you might have some jealous girls, some jealous maidens, and you might have some boys that have different plans than God has for you. You stay right here, and we're all going to follow the Lord together and do the right thing while we're abiding in this field. That's the kind of a temperature we need to have in the family of God among ourselves, guys. Trust and love and blessed, knowing that God's taking care of us through each other, not I've got to look out for you. In my last 30 years of ministry, you've always had to look out for the fools. You always had to look out for the devils who have crept in unaware. And there's people that come praising you. Oh, Johnny boy, I've been looking for you. Your preaching is so amazing. It's not like anybody else's. I'm like, okay, he'll be here less than a year. And that's the way it's always been. What you need is just the quiet folks who revere the Lord, who love him and work next to the person next to him in love, loving the person next to him while they work, fearing God, being God's disciples, being God's reapers, being God's workers in his field, knowing that the sun is setting and there will be no more daylight to do any reaping. Work while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. Take care of your business. Do what you've been called to do and love the people in the field next to you. And Boaz says, hey, you stick fast by my maidens. They'll take care of you. And my boys, you can, you can count on the fact that they will not be messing with you and giving you a hard day. They're going to love you like brothers and take care of you too. Isn't that great? And this was all the first day on the job. First day on the job, he set it out for her. And she knew the facts, Jack. And she was 
well pleased in the mannerisms and the promises. And she could have hope tomorrow when I go to that field. I'm going to have some friends and girlfriends and the maidens, and those guys are going to take care of me like brothers. And they they fear the Lord. They fear the master. They know that he loves the Lord and he knows they love him. Boy, that'd be a good church to go to, wouldn't it? Be that church, folks. The church is you. You be that one. You be that Boaz. You be that Ruth. You be the maidens. You be the fellows working in the field. Just find your position, do what it is, and you do it to the Lord. Bring him glory, man. The Lord bless you too, bro. Amen. Verse 9. You go, go not after any other field. Have not I charged the young men here that they shouldn't even touch you? And when you're thirsty, you feel free at any time to go over there to our vessels, my vessels, the vessels I drink from. You go right over there under the shade hut and you fix yourself up. You make yourself at home. You are one of us. Good night! I've never been to a church and on the first day felt that way. And if I did, it didn't take about a year and a half to not feel that way in the presence of those same folks. Because a lot of folks can put on a front and they can talk all holy and righteous up front and I'm following the Lord. Lord bless you! And then just keep Abiding in that field and working for a little while. And you'll see who's who. And I'm encouraging you people to be the person who is consistent, who's always loving the Lord, who is truly true. Your heart is a match of the Bible. And your actions are a match of your heart because your character is based on your thoughts. Think right, do right. Do right, it becomes a habit. And your habits become a character. And you need your character straight with the Lord. And everybody needs to know how to expect to find you in the field tomorrow. And on the first day, our wonderful kinsman redeemer lays it out. The Bible, it's been laid out for you. Every bit of it. On the first day, oh, you're a Christian? Here, here's a Bible. Let me disciple you. And the first day, God lays it all out. How fast can you read? It's all laid out from Genesis to Revelation. Let's figure out what the kinsman redeemer has said. He's welcomed us into his field. He wants us blessed. He wants us blessed with our brothers and sisters. And dude, he's got a thousand years from now in mind. While you, the believer, are ruling and reigning with him. Why don't you have two months ahead in mind and quit living for yourself, your own desires, your own wickedness, your own Satanism, which is self first me 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 why don't you quit doing that and have faith in the blessed hope in about two months and a week from now that's when we'll finish counting our first 50 days and i got no reason to believe that the lord ain't going to rapture us in the first 50 days why don't we have a blessed hope ex expectation the lord's laid it all out for us on the first day of the work but you know what happens we'll go out there and tell people how to be saved and we won't offer them discipleship and tell them what the Lord's offered them, man. What's in it for them? And they just drag around. They'll still be saved. Once saved, always saved. But they won't grow in the Lord. They won't understand his wonderful, beautiful, joyful, I mean, incredibly awesome word. And his commands. And his heart. And his expectations. What a blessing. What a blessing. The guys ain't going to touch you. And when you're thirsty, you get over there and you get you some water and you drink of that which the young men have drawn. You don't even have to draw your own water. I got somebody else doing that. They're drawing the water. They'll get it for you. You just enjoy the water. Our God's good, guys. First day on the job, he's good. He's awesome. You may be that widow. You may be the bottom rung, but your Lord is taking care of you where you are. However, you find yourself in that field. The foreman, the young men, the maidens, the water drawers, just serve the Lord where you are, will you? And quit complaining. Quit do bon, on, on. Woe is me. Bon, on, on, on. But look at thee. You got it great. Bon, on, on, on. All I got some hate. Quit that. Love where you are. Love where God. You didn't just happen to be where you are. <clears throat> you need to learn God's heart where you are and then advance. Poor Pleasant, Naomi, she was down there in Moab and it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time. She got so far away from the Lord, man, bitterness crept in and she didn't even know how to be better. 
But now we're in the middle of coming home. And God's changing the story in Naomi's life. The story hadn't changed, but Naomi's going to see it from God's perspective here shortly and not her own. Please, guys, when you look at life from your perspective, it can be bitter. It can be bad. Never do that. You always look at it from the eyes of Scripture with God looking seven years ahead from now, a thousand years ahead from now, and a millennia plus ahead from now. Trust Him with you. Trust Him with you. Can He trust you with Him? Two and a half months. Are you going to go all out for Jesus in His presence, in His love, in His glory, in His graces, in His mercy, in His character, and have the folks around you know it? And I have to walk on eggshells around you? Or, oh, man. Oh, don't open your mouth, sister, because everything she says is negative. Oh, don't open your mouth. Do people think that about you? Oh, I wish you'd shut up, man. Fewer words, the better. Is that what they think about you? Or do you bring glory and laud and honor to the Lord and to them? God bless you today. This is about you. This ain't about me. Boaz didn't step in the field and say, okay, guys, check me out. I'm great. I'm the richest guy in town. I got some fields. I got some servants. I got maid servants, men servants, water drawers. I got, I got the widows chasing me down. Now, he said, the Lord bless you too. God bless you. God bless you. And it was a real blessing and the people knew it. His servants didn't want to go anywhere. His servants knew that when he said something, he meant it. Don't touch that girl. Don't you dare touch that girl. They're like, cool, I'm cool with that, man. Boom. And they listened to the master. They listened to the kinsman redeemer. Will you please listen to the word of God? Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He bought us back from Moab. He bought us back from sin. He bought us back from a graveyard. When it looked like we were dead and there was no hope for us, Jesus paid the price for all of us. Now, will you go pay the price for him and be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him? It's just your reasonable service to be a good person in the eyes of God, to be a godly person, to be a Bible person, to read the Bible and walk it out and make God your everything. That's your reasonable service. The massive majority of Christians will not do this today. They're so busy with celebrating the dead of Babylon, Memorial Weekend. They're celebrating those who gave their life, who, who gave themselves as a sacrifice of blood for Satan. And they don't recognize that because they don't know God. They don't know Jeremiah 50 and 51. They don't know Hosea. They don't know who Ephraim is and God's hatred for us here in the USA. They're out there just praising the Lord and having a good time. Oh, thank God. And right after they pray for their meal, if they prayed for their meal, he's totally forgotten and not even in any of their thoughts. But not Boaz. First thing come out of his mouth was the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ in the ears of everybody around him. And they blessed him back. It was the first thing in their hearts. He trained them well. He discipled them well. And it was blessing, blessing, blessing. Even the water drawers were blessed. And they were loving to be able to provide Ruth with some water. Verse 10. And the young men have drawn, verse 10, and she fell on her face in humility and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why are you so nice to me? I have never known anybody in my life to be this nice to me. Why have I found grace in your eyes? Now, guys, the Bible commanded him to allow all this to happen. She could have said, yep, okay, yeah, God said so, so that's the way we're going to do this thing. And she wasn't looking for trouble like Naomi and didn't see all the bad. She was wondering, why are you so nice? Why are you so gracious? Why are you so kind to me? Why have I found favor in your eyeballs? Didn't she say to her mother-in-law that she was going to go out until she found a man that in whose eyes she could be, find grace? Well, praise God. He, she happened upon this guy's field. God was at work. Do not hate it when something goes wrong in your life when you're walking with Jesus. You got to understand that he's about to work it all together for good to those that love him. Who loves him? Those that love his word.
love his word, listen to his word, and you praise him no matter what. Do not complain. Do not be miserable. Do not let bitterness, envy, strife, jealousies pour forth out of your mouth and your heart. But let everything in your heart be replaced with the word of God, the love of God, the fruit of the spirit. And let that come out of your life and let everybody know it. The Lord bless you this morning. The Lord bless you, Mr. Boaz. And she said, falling on her face in humility, why have I found grace in your eyes that you should take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger? And he answered. Now, guys, that word answered is he uh, turned his voice up just a little bit in volume, as in I want everybody to hear this answer. He raised his voice. Why have you taken knowledge of me, seeing I'm such a stranger? And he raised his voice and said to her, It has faithfully been shown all that you have done unto your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how, in case there was somebody there that didn't know the story, he's informing them of the story. This is who this woman is. She's a widow. She's a widow indeed. Her mother-in-law, who she's living with, is a widow indeed. It, it hath been shown to us how you have treated your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and mother in the land of your nativity and are come into a people which you didn't know before now. Your faith has exploded around this place. Because when Naomi and them left, there was nothing to really have faith in unless you had faith in the scriptures. And they looked around them and there was no wheat in the field. There was no barley. There was no food. It was famine. And they made a decision on their own outside the scriptures and God's promises. And they said, let's head on down to Sinville. Let's go to Vegas. Let's go to New York City, man. Let's do this. Let's go to LA. How many lives, how many souls have been destroyed doing that, making that kind of a decision? I encourage you not to make any of those kinds of decisions based on what your eyeballs see. Accept that what your eyeball saw in the scriptures and you believed it. The Lord gave you his blessed word and he's also given you a blessed hope. But it's going to take your faith to activate that blessed hope in your life. You're going to have to see to his truth before you see it in the field. Before you see it with your eyeballs, you're going to have to believe what God said. The blessed hope, the blessed promise being revealed. And it's all coming to by way of what the Bible said. And I'm going to believe what the Bible says. Amen. I'm going to believe every bit of it, man. He said, I heard the whole story how you left your mom and dad and your land of where you were born and raised, and you're come to this people that you had no idea. Verse 12, the Lord recompense your work. The Lord repay your faith. The Lord bless you, triple you in your faith that you have shown, that you have displayed to all of us. Remember, his voice is still raised, and everybody in the field is hearing him talk to her and what's he doing praising god the boss continues to praise god he showed up in the field at work that morning praising god and the people praise back and now he's still giving glory to god in a testimony and the lord jehovah let him repay your work and a full reward be given to you of the lord god how many times is this guy going to say Jehovah? But he's the boss. Why don't you be that kind of boss? Why don't you be that kind of dad? Why don't you let your children hear you talking about Jesus all the time in honesty? Not just before men that they may hear you because your kids see you when you know, you're being really you. And why don't they see Jesus Christ in you and hear the words that are coming out of your mouth? And why don't you raise your voice up so everybody else around you can hear what you're saying and know what you believe? Know where you stand instead of being that mousy, quiet thing. Boaz, he was, he was a man of might. That's what his name means. And in his being a man of might, he maintained his integrity. He maintained his name. He lived up to his name. And his might was Jehovah. He was strong because of God. He was strong because of the word. He was strong because of truth. And all he had was Genesis to Joshua. He was living in the middle of the Judges and Ruth. He had six books. And in that six books, he found a God who was dependable, who could be trusted. 
and who he wasn't afraid to follow and yell across the field his name. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. And the people believed. And he says, may Jesus Christ pay you back in full reward and may it be given to you of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come to trust. Remember Jesus? Oh, Israel, Israel, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I would have taken care of you like a mother hen gathering up her chickens. When that hawk is flying over to kill all the baby chickens, you just get under my wing and that hawk will leave us alone. And I came here to do that, but you wouldn't allow me to do that. You didn't want to come under my wings. But he looks over at her and says, but you did. You have come under the wings of Almighty God and you've come under his blessing and may he recompense you your work and full reward be given to you, the Lord God, and who you have come to trust. Have you come to trust God that way? For your finances, for your next meal, for your next bite? If you'll get up and say, Naomi, I've got to, I'm going to go do something. I'm going to follow the Lord. You're going to do more than just happenstance into a man's field who can bless you. The Lord's here to take care of you. He promised you. My God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In the meantime, you praise Christ Jesus. You lift up your voice. You let hear people, uh, you let people hear you describing him, singing of him, singing his praises, and you be a good representation of him. You let them know you're under his wing, and anybody under his wing is going to be safe and taken care of. But you know what? These people didn't hear that story. They didn't know the story about the chicken. When they heard taken under the wings, they were thinking of the Ark of the Covenant and the two cherubs whose wings were touching there. And it was God himself in the midst of those. And God says, you've come unto me under the wings of the Almighty, which is represented in the wings of those cherubs touching each other on the mercy seat of God. Will you bring yourself under that today? That's the word of God. Will you please read it in big chunks? Will you take this Bible code and understand that it is from God? And it is for us. It is a detailed end times parchment that we can read and understand it and we can find shelter under the wings of these truths. Will you do that? Everybody here has heard how you have done that, Ruth. Has anybody heard how you've done that? Are you under the wings of the Almighty? Are you shouting His praises and hallelujah? Are you being a faithful one? The whole town knew it. I don't have any record of Ruth walking about telling of her faithfulness in God, but somehow that message got out because she was faithful to God. She had crawled up under His wings and said, I, I need you to protect me. I'm a widow, a widow indeed. I'm a widow of a widow. And I need some help, Lord. And he directed her steps all the way straight to blessing. And the first thing she heard when Boss showed up was, Praise the Lord! God bless you all! And I want you, honey, to be just like all the rest of my people in the field. Rejoicing, singing, believing, drinking anytime they wanted to drink, getting in the shade anytime they wanted to. You make yourself among the blessed. And folks, we encourage you as you work the field of souls, you work the field of God waiting for that harvest. We're about there to work it faithfully, man. Watch God bless. Just stay under his wings, the wings of his mercy seat, the wings of his word, the wings of his truth, and you believe it. That's where the protection is. His wings are out, and there are a lot of people believe in his wings, and they believe in their, his, their protection, and, oh, yeah, the word of God's powerful, but they don't read it. And therefore, they have removed themselves from the wings. We're encouraging you to get under the wings and understand every word of God and believe every word of God. And that hope, your faith in that hope will bring results, a harvest. Boy, go to heaven with everything God intended for you to have. You be faithful. You walk with him. Find your position. Everybody can't be the foreman out in the field. And everybody can't be Boaz, and everybody can't be the young maidens, and everybody can't be the young men, and everybody can't be the water drawers. You just find out who you are, and it might just be a little nobody who has no husband, no family, nothing except God. And there's great blessing in that. 
get up under his wing and you be blessed, you be blessed, you be blessed, and you bless others in your blessing. You have that faith in the blessed hope, and there's a harvest to come in. We're about to see Jesus. He's our blessed hope. He has promised in his scripture that's what he's going to do. He's promised in the coded text that's what he's going to do. And guys, believe him. He's about to come get us. You just work faithfully from sunup to sundown every day for his glory and bring him glory. Amen. Why don't we pray? Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this word today. And may it take root in our lives. May we be a people of character, a people of your word, a people who share your good news to others, who bless others, who they can always depend on hearing your blessings come from our mouths and see our character, our lives, our attitudes matching your scripture. May it be so true of every one of us listening right now. And if it's not, I pray that you'll do a work, Holy Spirit. Work that consuming fire on us to get rid of all the dross, all the wickedness, all our own selfish decisions and reasonings. Get rid of that and just follow your, your word, your leadership the way you want us. So I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen, guys. I love you. I've seen God's work in my life when I rest in his wings. Believe, have faith, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. Amen. I love you guys. Hey, by God's grace, we will see you at the 726 tonight. Love you and I mean it. God bless.